The English Bible is the most widely read book in the world. It's a bedrock of English literature and at the heart of British culture. Right at the start of things, it's sort of hot-wired into our national life. Yet once it was banned, for centuries the English could read the Bible only in Latin. Just possessing an English Bible could lead to death at the stake. This is the story of the revolution which changed all that. A struggle about something very profound indeed, how you were saved. The story of how men gave their lives to bringing the Bible into English. John Wycliffe, Thomas Cranmer, and William Tyndale. They changed the church. I don't think it would have been possible to have the Church of England as we know it without Tyndale. And in doing so, they changed England itself. As for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and the Antichrist. And the arrival of the English Bible was to have momentous consequences. Not just for English Christians, but for people all over the world, believers and unbelievers alike. People get saved by believing that gospel and by no other means. Whatever happens in America is going to be exported. Works that way for good or bad. It was a Bible revolution. Ah! Oh, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. These words, so resonant and familiar, only entered English culture when they were printed in 1526. Let thy kingdom come. Thy will be fulfilled as well in earth as it is in heaven. They were part of the first translation ever of the Gospels into English from the original Greek. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive our trespasses. England was the only country in Christendom where it was illegal to read the Bible in the mother tongue. The authorities thought that if English people were allowed to read it for themselves, they might start to think for themselves too, and that would never do. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. Yet within 300 years, that translation had transformed how we English spoke to each other, how we wrote our books, and how we saw our God. But it did more even than that. It fundamentally changed the way in which we thought of ourselves. England was once the most devoutly Catholic country in Europe. Now it had become fiercely, proudly, independently Protestant. And it believed that it had God's providence to thank for that. The translation of the Bible into the mother tongue was the crucial defining factor in all of this. Not just for English people here in England, but for our American descendants and for the rest of the English-speaking world. The consequences were enormous and they're still with us today. Our story of the English Bible begins in the middle years of the 14th century. A dark, dark time. Between 1348 and 1350, a plague spread across Europe. The Black Death killed between a third and half of the population. Whole communities, like Chalford, were wiped out. Nothing now remains of the village except this stone gateway and the husks and sunken lines of the vanished walls. Of course, the poor people afflicted by this plague had not the remotest notion of where it had come from, how it was transmitted from person to person, and still less how to get rid of it. And this void, this lack of understanding, was, of course, filled by God. They believed that the Black Death must somehow be a judgment upon them for the evil in their hearts. And they feared not just for their lives, but for their very souls. They turned to the church for reassurance.
corpus et sanguis fiat delictissimum filium tuum, Domini nostrum Jesu Christ. The church was the supreme way to heaven for uh, everyone. I'm not saying that every Englishman was a devout church-going, mass-attending, uh, a fully believing Catholic, but uh, the faith and uh, Catholicism was sort of impregnated into our whole culture. It wasn't the Bible which was at the heart of the late medieval church, it was the mass, the sacrament, with the supposed power to confer eternal life. This ritual, in which bread and wine were believed to turn into the actual body and blood of Jesus, was as important as the gospel itself. And this importance was vastly increased by the devastation wrought by the Black Death. It stimulated uh, concern with purgatory and prayers for the dead. There was almost an excessive preoccupation, I think, with, with prayers for the dead, masses for the dead, people having 10, 20, 30,000 masses said for them. The priests performed the ritual in Latin, not English, facing the altar with their backs to the people. As for the Bible, most of the population was illiterate. They heard fragments of Bible stories as part of the liturgy, and of course they could look at wall paintings and stained glass. If they heard the Bible itself at all, it was in Latin too, which almost no one understood, and in a translation which was a thousand years old. Performing the rituals and doing what you were told by the priest, that's what got you into heaven. And that gave priests huge authority, not just within the church, but in the state as well. What's more, the church in England was then a mere outpost of an enormous international institution which covered the whole of Western Europe. And over the whole church lay the supreme authority of the Pope. But in the 1370s, an Englishman challenged that authority. He lambasted the wealth and political power of the church. He questioned its holy sacrament, the mass, and he attacked the spiritual authority of its priests. His name was John Wycliffe. He was the leading theologian of his age, and he staked his reputation on these ideas. And he did so from within the belly of the beast. Oxford University, one of the church's most important institutions and arguably the greatest seat of learning in Europe. And at the heart of his challenge lay this conviction, that the Bible, the scriptures, and not the church or some pope, were the source of Christian authority. By about 1370, um, about the time when he became a doctor of theology, um, he started to realise that without the God's law, as he called the Bible, without God's law in the ordinary mother tongue, um, lay people were simply not getting enough access to what the Bible actually said. Now, knowing this, why may we not write in English the gospel to the edification of men's souls? Wycliffe's close reading of scripture revealed how far the church he knew had diverged from that original Christian vision. Outraged, he called for radical renewal. In 14th century England, this was pretty dangerous stuff, and it came at a time when the church itself was deep in trouble. In Rome, there'd been a disputed election, resulting in the unusual occurrence of two popes, one in Rome, where you might expect him to be, the other in Avignon in France. Wycliffe, of course, was gleeful about this. I always knew the Pope had cloven hooves, he said. Now he has a cloven head to match. For others, of course, it signalled a descent into chaos. There was another reason why the authorities at this time were a little bit sensitive. The people of England were on the march. In 1381, only a year after Wycliffe made his attack on the mass, huge crowds descended on London protesting against a poll tax. The government gave way, at least initially. Almost all the contemporary writers accused Wycliffe of instigating this peasant's revolt. They said its leaders were effectively his disciples. In truth, it's most unlikely that Wycliffe had anything to do with the revolt. 
but it only reinforced the reaction against him. The denunciations will surely follow, and indeed they were swift in coming. His ideas were attacked right here in this very church, University Church Oxford, and a fatwa decreed that his teachings were heretical, and for the first time, Wycliffe's followers were referred to, rather sneeringly, as mutterers or lollards. But never mind what the church thought, Wycliffe's lollard ideas, and particularly his emphasis on scripture, began to percolate out into the population at large. And England was a country yearning for a message like this. Wycliffe was that most dangerous thing, a man of the people. Their salvation was his foremost concern. Therefore, lay people should be taught to know the faith in whatever language is most familiar. The degree of trust this invested in ordinary people, the commoners, was quite revolutionary. Wycliffe believed that everyone must be able to read the Bible in their own language. Only this would enable a direct relationship with God. And the English hadn't been able to do that for 300 years. Unlike the church today, the medieval church insisted on using the traditional Latin Bible. The text was thought to be the word of God. But it wasn't even the original. It was itself a translation made in Roman times from the original Hebrew and Greek texts. And since then, a thousand years had passed. Few people spoke Latin. So ordinary Christians were left far behind, unable to access the teachings at the core of their religion. The English Bible is absolutely basic because if people are to assimilate this story as their story, then they need to have it available. It's fundamental. It's the word of God and it underpins everything. They need to have it in terms they understand. You don't have to be an expert to read it. Um, you can get so much from it without knowing any theology or philosophy or history. Now, what happens in the Middle Ages very, very broadly is that that is something which comes across only rather patchily in public worship. And one of the protests is, how do we get the whole story? It allows you to get direct access to the truth. I couldn't imagine not being able to read the Bible. Wycliffe and his Lollards thought it intolerable that Christians should be denied direct access to their holy book. They were determined to put the Bible into English. And that decision was to have the most momentous of consequences. And for a few brave Englishmen, it would mean arrest, interrogation and death. In late 14th century England, a revolutionary movement began. Englishmen, followers of John Wycliffe, or Lollards, began to translate the Bible into their own language. In the beginning, God marred of Nacht, heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The source of the earth was evil, and, and the void. earth was without form and, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of the Lord was born. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God sighed, Licht be mad. And Licht was mad. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And the evening and the morning were the first day. In translating the Bible, the Lollards were rescuing and perhaps defining their own language. 300 years before, in Anglo-Saxon England, people had made translations of parts of the Bible. Early English had developed the finest vernacular literature in Europe. was idle and empty. But after the Battle of Hastings and the Norman Conquest, French and Latin took over. The native English was not quite dead, however, and in this new Bible, it would rise again. And this is it, a Bible translated by Wycliffe and his associates, and this copy finished in 1408, after six months of the most painstaking transcription into this beautifully preserved and elegant hand. 
and translated not from Greek or from Hebrew, but from the only thing they really had available to them, which was Latin. There are, in fact, two different versions of the Wycliffeite Bible. The first of them is very literal indeed, and that is following both the Latin word order and the Latin words. The later version of the Wycliffeite Bible is deliberately much more idiomatic, uh, much closer to what people actually spoke. That idiomatic English translation fitted the spirit of the times. There is a political resonance. Nationalism was associated with the English language, perhaps more strongly than it was with the land of England itself. So yes, the existence of the Bible in English certainly had some effect towards the defining of an English nationalism. That was why some of the most powerful people in the country had encouraged new writing in English, and why Wycliffe had supporters. And here, at his church in Lutterworth near Leicester, there is evidence of the extent of that support. The church was painted in Wycliffe's time. It shows two kings and a queen, and there's a local tradition that it refers to Wycliffe's guardian angels, King Richard II, his queen, and his uncle, John of Gaunt. Richard II and John of Gaunt protected Wycliffe and his ideas from the furious denunciations of the established church. And so he was able to remain here in Lutterworth and continue his work on a translation of the Bible. And it was here, a few years later, and peacefully enough, that he died. Not long after he died, the translation of the whole Bible into English was completed. But the church was still enraged. A series of repressive measures tried to put a stop to the Lollard movement Wycliffe had inspired. In 1407, Wycliffe's books were banned and the English translation of the Bible with them. From now on, just possessing a copy of the English Bible was evidence of heresy. And heresy was punishable not simply by death, but by burning. In 1415, 30 years after his death, a full council of the whole church condemned Wycliffe as a heretic, and a bizarre ritual resulted. In 1428, nearly half a century after he was buried, Wycliffe's body was dug up again by the authorities. This macabre ritual was the church's revenge. Haec Santos Enodos, declarat defes in scientiat, eundem Joannem Wycliffe, this holy council declares, defines and determines the same John Wycliffe to have been a notorious and persistent heretic, indeed to have died as a heretic. Then his body was handed over to the authorities and burned. Likewise, this council anathematizes him utterly and condemns his memory and decrees and orders that his body and bones if they can be distinguished from the bodies of the faithful, be exhumed and cast far from the cemetery of the church, according to the legitimate sanctions of canon law. By burning the corpse of Wycliffe, the authorities wished to destroy utterly his ideas, but it was a forlorn hope. the Lollard English Bible continued to be immensely popular among the common people of England. Even after the last high-profile Lollards had been executed, it continued to be searched out, passed around and read. More manuscripts of that Bible survived than of any other medieval English text, including Chaucer, despite the fact that it was illegal. Anybody reading or hearing um, the Wycliffeite Bible in the 15th century knows that they're doing it illegally. Some groups of lay people sort of clubbed together um, and got um, a manuscript written or bought a manuscript Bible, sort of which probably Bible would have book been book club. Accurate. Exactly, yes, they did have Bible book clubs in the 15th century. This was some way short of a reformation. The Lollards had scant interest in demolishing the established church. They were more concerned with living good, pious Christian lives. But one book survives from that time, the Lollard Bible. It was illegal, 
and the fact that it was beyond the law was an affront which rankled with English people for the next century and a half. And then, in the time of King Henry VIII, the frustration boiled over. A new attack was made on the church establishment, and with it came a new and potent translation. An English gospel translated from the original Greek texts, and in words which would transform the English language itself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by it, and without it was made nothing that was made. Most of what we know of the Bible today was translated by one man. He was a scholar who came from Gloucestershire. He was born in 1494, less than a century after Wycliffe died at Lutterworth. His writings were to change English culture and the English language forever. And his name was William Tyndale. And the light shineth in the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. Tyndale seems to have had a sort of ear for the memorable, for the rhythms and patterns of the spoken word. What we call the authorised version of the 17th century is really Tyndale revised. And some of the most memorable phrases are Tyndale's. So not just a translator, certainly not a hack translator on any definition. What really drove Tyndale was a passionate desire to put the Bible directly into the hands of believers. Who is so blind to say they cannot be showed the light who walk in darkness? For they cannot but stumble. And where to stumble is the danger of eternal damnation. It was no coincidence that the great translator came from Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire was a rich weaving district, and like many other cloth regions, it was a focus of Lollard descent. Lollardy was very alive, and it would have been phenomenal if he hadn't been aware of it as a boy. It had gone underground after the two peasants' revolts. It was not safe, but the effect had been great. There were... Wycliffe Bibles, Lollard Bibles in English from the Latin, around. And this wasn't just an upper-class fad. What was remarkable about Lollardy, which contributed greatly to Tyndale's understanding of the need, was that everybody was in the picture. Um, the Bible was read to everybody. That was what scared churchmen. Even though it had been decades since Lollard ideas had been a real threat, the ban remained. Occasionally, the local bishops conducted a purge, and when they did so, they discovered that Wycliffe's ideas were far from forgotten. In one case, in 1506, 60 people were arrested in one village alone, and two burned as heretics. In Gloucestershire, Tyndale's family were established local landowners. But it's possible that they were also, in their hearts at least, rebellious Lollards. We don't know for sure. Certainly, they didn't give voice to their opinions. Tyndale, as we know, was going to be very different. But it was only after he left this area for Oxford that he began to speak the words which already he was thinking. Since Wycliffe's time, the intellectual world had been transformed. First, the invention of printing had vastly increased the number of books in circulation, far more titles and huge editions. But even more important for Tyndale was the explosion of scholarship in the Renaissance. The ancient languages, Hebrew and Greek, in which the Bible was originally written, were now widely studied. New manuscripts were discovered, and they were much better understood but the church's grip on intellectual life remained. 
When Tyndall arrived here at Oxford, it was to a place which still seethed with paranoia about all things Lollard. This was, after all, the university which, to its shame, had offered succour to Wycliffe. And so there was a deep suspicion of anyone arriving here with unorthodox religious views. And still worse for Tyndale, even if you studied theology, there was no requirement to do so directly from the scripture. And yet it was here that Tyndale found his destiny. While he was a student at Oxford, the great Dutch scholar Erasmus produced a remarkable edition of the New Testament. It consisted of the original Greek text with his Latin translation beside it. Erasmus translated it into Latin to achieve an international, if academic, audience. At last it was possible for Christians all over Europe to go back to the original words of the Gospels, to return to the world of the Apostles. The Greek was completely unknown until Erasmus printed it. And this was a sensationally important printing. The New Testament is a Greek thing, and anything else is a translation. The impact of that on Tyndale was colossal. It was a revelation, perhaps the most important in his life, and it gave him his vocation. While he was at Magdalen, Tyndale read scripture privily to certain students and fellows. So I think he's reading the Greek New Testament translated by him to them. And I think the vocation happened on the arrival of Erasmus's New Testament. Tyndale was not alone in his excitement. Right across Europe, Erasmus's text was a signal for religious eruptions. The most important was in Wittenberg in Germany, where a monk called Martin Luther had made a close study of the text of the New Testament, bringing him into bitter conflict with the church. To him, the power and wealth of the church were a disgraceful exploitation of the faithful. His rebellion began what today we call the Reformation. It divided Europe forever. I don't think there's anything inevitable about what happened in the Reformation, but it was a struggle about something very profound indeed, how you are saved, how you get to heaven. And what Protestants said was what the Apostle Paul had said, that you and I can do nothing for our own salvation. It's all in the hands of God. Now that's Luther's message. The trouble was that the late medieval church had said to people, well, actually you can do things to be saved. There is a place called purgatory, you can stay there for a while, you can have prayers said for you, and these will help you get to heaven. That was what Luther objected to, the idea that you and I can do things. Luther wouldn't shut up when the Pope told him to, and that moment was what caused the split. Across Europe, a new, more violent age was dawning. But in England at that time, the church was pretty adept at suppressing religious dissent. Tyndale knew that putting the Bible into English was both a difficult and dangerous job. For one thing, the new scholarship, with its emphasis on the original texts, made it a far more complex and intellectually demanding task. And then, actually printing a Bible was a far more public act than simply copying a manuscript. You could reach a lot more people that way, but you ran the perpetual risk of exposure. Remember, the English Bible was still illegal. But Tyndale was undeterred, and in 1522, he left Oxford and began work back home in his native Gloucestershire. Over in Germany, Luther's Reformation was gathering pace. That very autumn, he published his own German translation of the New Testament. It was an enormous success. Instead of being banned, it sold out in weeks, and Luther began to take his place in German history. The Bible translation surely is the biggest thing Luther ever did. Imagine the influence Shakespeare had on the English language then you get an idea what Luther means for German. He had a great ear for the way people talk to each other. 
when the first edition of the New Testament appeared in 1522 in September, it was the huge amount of 3,000 copies. And they were sold out within eight weeks. In Gloucestershire, working ostensibly as a tutor to the children of a local grandee, Tyndale continued his translation in emulation of Luther. He thought he'd be safe. He was wrong. Although Lollards were not scarce and there were like-minded souls in Gloucestershire, even here there was trouble. It had become a rather dangerous time to give voice to religious dissent. Overseas, Martin Luther had been excommunicated by the Pope. And King Henry VIII, or one of his palace spin doctors, had written a vituperative attack upon Luther's ideas. And now Tyndale wasn't merely illegally translating the Bible. He was also pushing unorthodox religious views from the pulpit. He was largely preaching St Paul and the idea of personal faith, which came to him from Lollardy and also from his reading of the Greek New Testament, was against a great deal of what was being taught by the church. Tyndale was called before the local bishop's court. Tyndale wrote about it later, saying that uh, the chancellor rated me like a dog. But after all the shouting, nothing happened. It's very interesting. Despite his powerful friends, Tyndale was now fatally compromised, but his determination was undimmed. If God spare me, ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plough shall know more scripture than thou dost. In Germany, Luther's protests had been supported by his local ruler. That had meant there were big changes to church life, with services in the native language and a Bible to match. It was clear now that Tyndale was going to get nowhere in England without official protection of this kind. So, having been driven out of his native Gloucestershire, Tyndale came to London for one last throw of the dice. For Tyndale, this was truly a vocation. It's all very well to translate the Bible. The point, however, was to spread it throughout the land so that everyone could get that sense of religious transformation. And to a degree, the politics and the doctrinal issues didn't impinge upon Tyndale at all. He was a pragmatist. If he could get one eminent churchman to wave the ban, to give him dispensation, then that would do. The man he chose was the Bishop of London. He lived right here next to St Paul's Cathedral, and his name was Cuthbert Tunstall. Tunstall was an intellectual, and he knew all the key figures in the new scholarship movement. Tunstall was a, a good, clever man who knew his Greek, close friend of Erasmus. Tyndale wrote to implore Tunstall to lift the ban. They say our tongue is too rude. It is not so. Has not God made the English tongue as well as others? Tyndale believed that if anyone would get the point, it would be Tunstall, and the letter, somewhat presumptuously, even suggested that Tunstall should take him into his household. Tunstall was known as somebody who may be an enemy, but wasn't going to burn people. But Tyndale's idea was what we might call politically inexpedient. Tunstall refused his application. For Tyndale now, the die was cast. I understood at last, not only that there was no room in my Lord of London's palace to translate the New Testament, but also that there was no place to do it in all England. It was in the spring of 1524 that Tyndale fled the country. His efforts to drum up support for translating the Bible into English had come to nothing. Friends and sympathizers might help tide him over, but no one was prepared to stick their necks out for him. In England, the Catholic establishment was seemingly winning its battle to prevent the publication of a Bible in the national tongue. 
but Tyndale was implacable. There just had to be a Bible for the ordinary men and women of England written in the English language. And if it meant he had to leave the country in order to bring this about, then so be it. He left, and Tyndall was never to see England again. But in exile, he would defy the authorities. His translation would rock the foundations of the English church and change the country forever. In 1524, William Tyndale had fled from England to finish his translation of the Bible. He came to Germany. It was a country in spiritual and political turmoil. Here, in Wittenberg, Martin Luther's outburst against the Pope had ignited a religious revolt. Lutheran churches in Germany had introduced the kind of reforms which once Wycliffe had hoped for and Tyndale now dreamed of. They had services in their own language instead of Latin and read their own Bible which was freely printed throughout the country. And they were able to do so because using the power of printing, Luther's ideas had made huge inroads into papal authority. So the obvious place for Tyndale to have come was Wittenberg, but in fact, there's very little evidence to go on. You can search through the letters and journals of Martin Luther and his associates, and you won't find any mention of this rogue Englishman, William Tyndale. And Tyndale himself, of course, for understandable reasons, tended to be a bit secretive about where he was and what he was doing. But there's one tantalizing piece of evidence. The matriculation book of Wittenberg University still survives. Everyone who came here to study had to be registered and swear allegiance to the university rules and statutes. Ah, now here's the book. And if we look down a page under the entry for 1508, we find the name Father Martin Luther of Mansfeld underlined in red. And then, 16 years later, there's something interesting. Guglielmus Dalton ex Angliae. William Dalton of England. Could that possibly be William Tyndale? Except he's changed around the last two syllables in order to put people off the scent. So, did Tyndale come to Wittenberg? We'll probably never know for sure, but certainly there's a sense in which Wittenberg came to Tyndale. This was the cradle of Lutheranism, and the ideas of religious freedom which spread throughout Germany strengthened Tyndale in his resolve that the same thing must happen in England. It was in Germany that Tyndale finished his translation of the New Testament. All around him was the clatter of foreign speech, but it didn't cloud his devotion to his native tongue. With his assistant, William Roy, a former English friar, he worked from the original Greek, with Luther's version of the Latin beside him. In doing so, he transformed the Greek text into the foundation of all subsequent English literature. Words written to be read out loud, which have entered our speech. He went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, and all men shall revile you. The translator always has this responsibility to be meaningful to his reader, and yet try and hold on to what the author intended. Tyndale was more than good, he was excellent. There are very good reasons for that. He knew probably seven languages. He was direct. He wanted Anglo-Saxon words. He didn't like the Latinate words. Uh, he tried to get the English words, and that's what we've received from him. Some people think Tyndale meant to do this. He certainly knew that the Anglo-Saxons had translated at least part of the Bible. But another potent influence was the dialect of his native county. Tyndale was using words which came from his own Gloucestershire. He talks about people being fainty, flaggy, goggle-eyed, mizzling. Mizzling. Now, the uh, authorised version says, light rain. OK, fine. Mizzling, you understand mizzling. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> that was his skill. He gave us our English. And he gave us the English of Shakespeare and every author, every writer ever since. We owe a huge debt to Tyndale. He gave us words which are in everyday usage. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth, a city. The powers that be are ordained And when the God. centurion which stood before him saw that he so cried and gave up the ghost, ye are the salt of the earth, then they having no law are a law unto themselves. Tyndale's language had about it a richness, a vitality, and an immediacy. But more than that, it was also a controversial and partisan text driven by a very particular reformist theology. And that, in turn, came from a translation which went right back to the original Greek and revealed a very different vision of Christianity, a vision which Tyndale believed had been willfully obscured by the traditional Latin of the Roman Catholic Church. Tyndale was becoming the English Luther. Luther liberated him. Luther's 1522 September Testament was a model for him. If, if Luther could do it in Germany, he could do it in England. And though I bestowed all my goods to feed... The very the words of his New I Testament expressed Tyndale's subversive theology. Instead of the word priest, he used presbyter or elder, which had no sacramental overtones. Instead of charity, which implied that you could buy your way into heaven with good works, he used love. Now abideth faith, hope and love, even these three. But the chief of these is love. And in Tyndale's translation, the mighty hierarchy of the church became just a congregation. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my congregation, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. To change these in any way was heresy because you were changing what the church said. The church could do no wrong. By August 1525, Tyndale was ready. He had completed the New Testament and added a prologue and some notes to the text. He moved to Cologne to have it printed. And then there was trouble. Hold on, appreciate it. The printer was raided. It was the first skirmish in the final battle for the English Bible. A few months after that Cologne raid, William Tyndale finally got his New Testament printed. Here it is. Doesn't look very much to worry about, does it? Nice compact size for handing around in private. And this is probably one of the most revolutionary books ever to be published. Within weeks, the first of thousands of copies began to make their way into England. 
The effect was incendiary and polarized the country into those who were for reform of the church and those who were against. Christianity in England was changed forever. Until Tyndale's translation began arriving from Germany, the challenge to the church in England had taken two basic forms. There was the old tradition of lollardy, which had survived since Wycliffe's day by withdrawing into the private sector. And there were a few people in the universities and in the merchant community who were in touch with events in Germany and knew about Luther's attack on the church. Neither, frankly, was much of a threat to the established order. Tyndale's work changed everything. Rather than just have to round up a few troublesome heretics, the government had to somehow prevent the circulation of thousand upon thousand of printed Bibles. And so suddenly you had the chance for a mass reform movement among common people. And indeed, once it arrived in England, Tyndale's New Testament became a bestseller. The rhythmic earthiness of Tyndale's language, written to be read out loud, attracted a huge audience. Even today, actors recognize it as almost the equal of Shakespeare. Now, I want to tell you a story. A certain man had two sons, and he divided unto them his substance. I think there is a, a great soul behind it. There is real, there's real humanity and warmth in it. You're talking about the moral and the beauty of the story coming across in the sound of the words and not just their meaning. And not long after, the younger son gathered all that he had together and took his journey into a far country. And there he wasted his goods with riotous living. There rose a great dearth throughout all that same land and he began to lack. And the word substance, which is, which is a substantial word, is then contrasted with the word lack, that cold monosyllabic, flat vowel. It's just, you can feel the gnawing in his tummy. And he would fain have filled his belly with the cods that the swine ate. Then he came to himself and said, how many hired servants at my father's have bread enough, and I die for hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. There's nothing designed to be in between the teller and the tale. Uh, it's very, very simple. There's almost no metaphor. It's designed to get the meaning across and the moral across as simply as possible. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But his father said to his servants, Bring forth that best garment and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither that fatted calf, and kill him, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is now found. The plain words and native rhythms of Tyndale's translation spoke straight to the hearts of the English people. Language like this was a missionary tool of enormous power. It unleashed a ferment of evangelical agitation, and the authorities, trembling with fury, were forced to react and punish the heretics. In London, Bishop Tunstall, whom once Tyndale had hoped would authorize his Bible, began burning it instead. Tyndale was outraged by what he saw as sacrilege. For what service done in Christ's gospel came he to the bishopric of London? And what service did he therein? He burnt the New Testament, calling it strange learning. Head cheerleader for the authorities was the famous Sir Thomas More. His work with the heretics was appalling. He said he wanted to burn heresy out of England with fire. And there are strong stories that seem to have a lot of credibility that he tortured and killed people. He was given permission to uh, read heretical English books. So to Tyndale's great surprise, he turned his attack on Tyndale. He was convinced that the Lutheran um, conspiracy was going to result in a sort of revolution in England and destruction of all that was good and beautiful. Uh, he saw uh, the, the Protestants, therefore, as, as a, a fundamental enemy to all that he cherished. 
Despite all this, as a result of his execution by Henry VIII, Moore has become a Catholic saint and is even revered by Anglicans. Is it wholly appropriate that the Anglican Church should revere Thomas More? It's very difficult, I think, to get a 360-degree picture of somebody and still admire and love them. Do we expect 100% in the examination, or do we expect that there are some bits of their lives that so dramatically let in the light that we can, if not forgive them the rest, at least thank God for the bit that lets in the light as overwhelmingly more important than the bits that block it. And that's what I feel about more. The repression continued. The government made attempts to have Tyndale captured and returned to England for trial. And when, in 1529, Moore became Lord Chancellor, the burnings began again. Burning heretics alive was a last brutal attempt to get them to recant and also convince anyone else with unorthodox religious beliefs that the teachings of the established church were de facto correct. And yet, despite this slow, tortuous manner of dying, many people did not recant. Among the victims was the Cambridge academic Thomas Bilney. Only the year before, he had given in to the authorities, terrified by the prospect of the stake. Now he went out of his way to antagonize Moore's men. He was arrested outside Norwich while distributing Tyndale's New Testament. Bilney's confidence was extraordinary. The night before his execution, he deliberately placed his finger in a candle flame. It was a test. I'm only trying my flesh. Tomorrow, God's rods shall burn my whole body in the fire. By God's holy word and the experience of the martyrs, when the flames consume me, I shall not feel them. But all the heroism and martyrdoms of the reformers seemed to be in vain. Government persecution went on. The burnings continued. The Bible stayed banned. And Tyndale himself was still on the run. In the late 1520s, Europe dissolved into vicious religious conflict. In England, the government pursued religious reformers with bitter fury and did all they could to suppress William Tyndale's English New Testament. We know that by now, Tyndale had found himself here in Antwerp. Back then, this was a huge city, one of the largest ports in Europe, and a place with a singularly independent frame of mind. Although under the dominion of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, and therefore Catholic, Antwerp's affluence was such that no one could push it around and tell it what to do. Trouble with heretics was bad for business, and so, provided they kept a low profile, Antwerp was, for the reformers, literally a safe haven. But there were other, more important reasons why Tyndale chose Antwerp. Just across the North Sea from England, Antwerp had a large and sophisticated English merchant community. They were able to give him a home while he completed his epic undertaking. Presumably affluent, independently minded, Tyndale would have had some protection hidden within them, would he? Well, he would have been protected because the English were so important for this town. Because they were the largest trading community, the magistrates would never have dared arrest an Englishman without a very serious reason indeed. And publishing an English Bible wouldn't have been a reason serious enough. And there was another reason why Tyndale wound up here. The Antwerp printing industry was enormous. There were five times as many printers than there were in London, and they printed books in huge numbers. And they didn't care too much about the law. It was a cat and mouse game, actually, with the Inquisition. It was a matter of smuggling. It was a matter of hiding the tiny leaves of these illegal books between the large leaves of books that were not forbidden. 
and they were stored here in, in the Antwerp warehouses and then shipped to England. You could make vast profits from smuggling Bibles into England, and now the Antwerp printers cashed in. A huge stream of English Bibles emerged from Antwerp. They crossed the channel as individual pages, hidden inside legitimate books printed for sale on the English market. These books were dangerous stuff, seditious contraband, and eagerly sought after. And who was in on this sort of subterfuge? Well, it was the big publishers and printers themselves, actually, especially the publishers that wanted to make money. It is amazing to see how well-established publishers smuggled on an unimaginable scale, and the publishers got very rich. It's reckoned that by the time Tyndale died, there were some 50,000 copies of his New Testament in circulation in England. The translation had been an absolutely massive undertaking, but he didn't stop there. Tyndale began work on the Old Testament, and within just two years, had completed the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And quite remarkably, he translated these books not from the fairly accessible Latin or Greek, but from Hebrew, a language he taught himself. And this simple fact has had a profound effect upon the language we use today. The Hebrew contained concepts for which there were no English words at the time. And the priest shall make an atonement for them. And I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, an almighty God, but in my name Jehovah was I not known unto them. Words like atonement and Jehovah were effectively invented by Tyndale and naturalized into the language. And ye shall eat it in haste, for it is the Lord's Passover. For the Hebrew Pesach, he invented a new English word, Passover, to describe the night when the angel of the Lord spared the firstborn of the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, I cannot tell. Am I my brother's keeper? And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of a bush. And he perceived that the bush burned with fire and consumed not. As a result of Tyndale's translation, proverbs and visions from the Hebrew scripture became integral parts of English culture. All this was done in Antwerp, a foreign city far away from Tyndale's native Gloucestershire. Even though he was protected to some extent, he was nonetheless permanently at risk. And meanwhile, the vicious, swirling politics of Tudor England began to have repercussions for Tyndale's mission. Across the water in England, King Henry was trying to have his marriage annulled. And that was causing one or two rather pressing political problems. A lot of people on both sides of the argument would die before the matter was properly resolved. For Tyndale, holed up here in Antwerp, it was difficult to predict exactly what would happen. For while his persecutor, Thomas More, continued a campaign against him, there were some reformers working in the government who thought that Tyndale could be useful to them. And so we enter the twilight world of espionage. Tyndale got a message that a man called Stephen Vaughan was looking for him. Vaughan claimed to have been sent by one of the King's senior officials, Thomas Cromwell. And he had. Despite his position, Cromwell was a convinced reformer and he wanted Tyndale in England. It had been seven years since Tyndale last saw his native land. He had seen how a reformer's church could work out in the open in Germany and how a Bible in the native tongue could be printed, distributed, taught and read legally and openly. 
Was it possible that King Henry could be persuaded, like the Elector of Saxony who had protected Luther? Was this Tyndale's moment? Tyndale agreed to meet the agent Vaughan, but not in Antwerp itself. That was too dangerous. The rendezvous took place in a field outside the city walls. Tyndale had a single condition. If the king would only allow bare text of scripture to be put forward as among the subjects of the emperor here, I would never write a word more. I would immediately throw myself at the feet of the king. Till then, I will endure all roughness of fortune. The message was relayed, but back in England, the offer was withdrawn. Tyndale's ideas, it seems, were just too dangerous. He was condemned to further exile. So Tyndale remained in Antwerp, continuing his translation of the Old Testament. And there was always the risk of betrayal and death at the stake. As he worked, the political merry-go-round continued. It was a dramatic time for England. The Pope wouldn't annul Henry VIII's marriage. So King Henry renounced all papal authority and made himself the supreme head of the church in England. Thomas More was imprisoned. Anne Boleyn became queen, and Thomas Cromwell, the counsellor most sympathetic to reform, who had sent Vaughan to Tyndale, ruled the roost at court. Seen from Catholic Antwerp, this must have looked to Tyndale like the beginning of the New Jerusalem. And yet things were not quite as they seemed. Henry VIII believed that control of the Church of England had been given to him through the Office of Divine Providence. But theologically, he was still at this point something of a traditionalist. He had no time for Protestant ideas. And the reformers had a lot of powerful enemies, some of them very rich indeed. Sometime in the spring of 1535, a young Englishman called Henry Phillips arrived in Antwerp. He had good contacts with the English community. Eventually, he was introduced to Tyndale, and they became friends. On the 21st of May, he called to take Tyndale out to dinner. He inveigled his way into Tyndale's interest. He pretended a great interest in the details of translating the Bible. Clearly, he'd been offered a very large amount of money if he could catch this arch heretic who was corrupting England. He was for money. Rather than oh, absolutely, yes. He'd, he was a horrible man, was Phillips. Phillips. I go forth this night to dinner, and you shall go with me and be my guest. After 12 years on the run, Tyndale's enemies had caught him at last. To this day, no one knows who paid Phillips to betray the heretic translator. But now he was arrested, his influential friends could do nothing for him. Tyndale was delivered to the officials of the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor. Tyndale was taken from Antwerp to a castle near Brussels. He was in solitary confinement for more than a year, without even his beloved Bible. From that moment, I think he's the man with the greatest command of the English language. After Shakespeare, never heard English spoken for 500 days. It would be Flemish or Latin. 500 days without light, without books, without anything. There was never any real doubt about his fate. In October 1536, he faced his final ordeal. It was a fate which had threatened him all his adult life, yet even now his conviction was undimmed. To the last, his aim was to bring the Bible to the English people. Lord, 
Open the King of England's eyes! Tyndale was to have been spared the horror of burning by being strangled beforehand. But it was a botched job. As the flames rose around him, he regained consciousness. I don't think it would have been possible to have the Church of England as we know it without Tyndale. Tyndale, in his translation of the Bible, shows you can have an English language that is earthy, very accessible, very, very vivid, located in this place for these people. Tyndale magnificently, triumphantly demonstrates that it can be done. Incredibly, only a few months after Tyndale had been murdered, the English people finally got the Bible he'd been convinced they must have. A terrible irony for Tyndale, a career spent often in hiding, dogged by persecution and vilification, to have missed by so short a period of time the realisation of his ambitions. And it was a brave and politically astute churchman who finally ensured that Tyndale's work must reach the masses. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and his name was Thomas Cranmer. Cranmer's actions would transform Christianity, not only in England, but across the globe, forever. Of the soul. Therein shall all manner of people, men, women, young, old, in 1540, the people of England were treated to a novel spectacle. Priests, laymen, lords, ladies. More than a century had passed since Wycliffe's corpse was dug up and burnt in Lutterworth. Virgins, wives, widows, lawyers, and all manner of persons of whatsoever condition and estate they be. And it was only a few years since Tyndale had died at the stake. So therein find all they ought to believe in. But now, an Archbishop of Canterbury, no less, was recommending that the people of England read the Bible in their own language, just as Wycliffe and Tyndale had wanted. The Archbishop's name was Thomas Cranmer, and it was a position he'd held since 1532. It was he, of course, who authorised King Henry VIII's divorce, and he'd been a close political ally of Queen Anne Boleyn. He's largely remembered today for having written most of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, a wonderful legacy in itself. But he was also a quintessential politician, constantly in touch with reformers overseas, and it was he who set the tone for the English Reformation, a Reformation which wasn't simply the whim of an autocratic monarch, but a huge political undertaking. All over England, you can see the wreckage of the medieval Catholic Church, the ruins of the monasteries closed by Henry VIII after his break with Rome. They're an enduring symbol of the revolution which hit England in the 1530s after Henry's wholesale takeover of the church. Some of the monasteries were more than 900 years old, and their wealth, including perhaps a third of all the land in England, came to the crown. In charge of all this was Thomas Cranmer. He was working hand in hand with Thomas Cromwell, the very man who had sent Vaughan to persuade Tyndale to return, and who was now chief minister. It's as if Cromwell was there to do the dirty work, the political work, the wheeler dealing, while Cranmer did the thinking, did the, the changing in the church. The other great ally for Cranmer for a while was his first great patroness, the second queen, Anne Boleyn. Without Anne, Cranmer's career would not have taken off. But it has to be said that when she fell, Cranmer did slide away from her. There was a greater cause, and that was the Reformation. 
Of course, Henry VIII relished the money the Cranmer Cromwell Reformation brought him. For one thing, it allowed him to build fortresses like this one to protect the coast. But there were many people who objected. At court, they cheered when Henry had the Protestant Queen Anne executed for treason in 1536. The reformist faction that had gathered around her lost power. But then the forces of conservatism went too far. By the end of the year, they were in open and violent rebellion. They were enraged at the rapidity with which their church was changing before their eyes, and even more than this, at the destruction of the monasteries. The revolt began in the north of England, and it scared King Henry Witless. But it also entrenched Cranmer and Cromwell in power, and so the reform of the church continued. There would be no backing down. Bible scripture in the mother tongue was the foundation of Protestant Reformation all across Europe. But it was still not officially available to people in England. Cranmer and Cromwell were in a great hurry. Within months of the rebellion, they'd persuaded King Henry to license the publication of this. It's called the Matthew Bible. It was printed in Antwerp and is supposedly the work of Thomas Matthew. Set forth with the king's most gracious license. But in fact, it was probably put together in exile by an Antwerp friend of Tyndale's. And much of the text is indeed Tyndale's. But it wouldn't have done to say so, so it's identified by these ornate initials, W.T. To those in the know, and there would have been a good many of them, it was a guarantee that this was the good stuff, the real thing. Shortly afterwards, Cranmer licensed another version by another exile, and then, after two years' heavy labour, Thomas Cromwell found the money to produce this. This is the Great Bible. In reading through it, you'll find it's pretty much as Tyndale had it. But from 1540, it carried an introduction from Archbishop Cranmer himself, which is as close to an official seal of approval as you're likely to get. It's also why it was sometimes known as Cranmer's Bible. Crucially, unlike Tyndale's translation, this was legal. It wasn't really licensed by the bishops. It was put physically into England's churches on royal command. And the effect was extraordinary. It is convenient and good for the scriptures to be read of all sorts and kinds of people and in the vulgar tongue in many ways, you could see the Reformation in England as just part of the great European story. But there's one big difference in England, and that's the shock, the excitement, the exhilaration of gaining the Bible in English. That's what made England different. It meant that the Bible became much more central than I think it was in many Protestant cultures, where preaching, hymns, might have said as much about Protestantism as the unfettered act of reading the Bible. Parish records up and down the land record the purchase of these Bibles. Even after Thomas Cromwell had fallen from power, royal orders made sure, thanks to Cranmer, that every parish in the land was forced to buy one. For many, hearing the word of God in English at last was more than a revelation. It was a revolution. Reading the Bible could be a political act, particularly in the early days. Very often, this was turned into an act of defiance against the old church. A mass would be going on at the other end of the church, up at the high altar, and people would stand shouting out the words of the Bible. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What really is going on in that is that essential Reformation declaration that you and I, individuals, stand in front of God. We don't need clergy, we don't need priests. That's in itself a hugely political statement, and it lies at the heart of much of English Protestantism in the centuries after. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Eventually every parish in the land had an English Bible, 
As a result of Cranmer's actions, everything Tyndale had hoped for had come to pass. But now the Bible had been translated into English, it was available to everybody who could read. Quite the most awful common people had the holy book in their paws, to do with what they will. And this was, for Henry, a serious problem, both aesthetically and, indeed, politically. Within just a few months, Henry was having second thoughts about his archbishop's venture. A partial ban was reimposed. By now, everybody was reading the Bible, which was not what the church, nor indeed the government, had intended, certainly not for your lower classes. And so they had access to the Bible withdrawn, a move which was somewhat unpopular. Evidence of the sort of personal disquiet it caused can be found in this rather wonderful old book. Remarkably enough, it was once owned by a shepherd who tended his flock in this very place on top of Saintbury Hill, overlooking the Vale of Evesham. And he bought the book in order to have something to read as he went about his lonely work, because, of course, King Henry VIII had taken his Bible away from him. As he explains, I bought this book when the testament was abrogated, that shepherds might not read it. I pray God amend that blindness. Written by Robert Williams, Keeping Sheep upon Saintbury Hill, 1546. By the time Henry VIII died in 1547, the question of England's religious future was still unresolved. Would the country be Roman Catholic, Catholic and not that Roman, or tending towards Protestantism? And now that the Bible had been translated into English, the debate hardened, and both Catholics and Protestants held the scripture aloft to justify their sense of rectitude. You may be unsurprised to learn that each side treated the other to a total and utter lack of tolerance, and mutual vindictiveness, cruelty and loathing. Because what happened next was nothing less than a cultural revolution. The new king was Henry's nine-year-old son, Edward, who, despite the old king's religious conservatism, had been brought up firmly in the Protestant camp. Cranmer was the new king's godfather. For him and the reformers, this was a great opportunity. The boy and his godfather marched hand in hand in this revolution. It became something really destructive of the old world, something bringing in the new. This is really ruthless, rapid change. Such was the devotion of the reformers to the unvarnished scripture, the word of God, that they attacked all the artistic imagery which had sustained the old church. For them, it was an abomination. For traditional English Catholics, this was sacrilege. Well, there was massive destruction of beautiful, irreplaceable, and holy things. The stained glass windows, statues, books, organs, and music, precious plate, and wonderful vestments, thousands of bells smashed, and so on and so forth. It was an appalling uh, cultural disaster in many respects, rather like uh, what happened in China under Mao, and, uh, or the French Revolution in France. Mass destruction, vandalism. I think there was nothing inevitable about the English Reformation. It would not have happened, and certainly would not have happened as it, in the way it did happen, if it hadn't been essentially a, a state-driven um, event. This is a, a, a hypothetical question. Would you have preferred it not to have happened? Uh, I would, yes. Unequivocally? Yes. As Cranmer's Reformation rolled on, the English Bible became the heart of the English Church. In six short years, it is estimated that 80,000 Bibles were printed in England. And King Edward's cultural revolution had its effect on English nationalism, too. In the middle of the 16th century, particularly in the reign of King Edward, you begin to get this sense of the English vocation, um, bound up with the English Bible, the English prayer book, the Church of England. A very ambiguous thing, a very um, two-edged sword as the centuries unfold. But that's, I think, where its roots lie. 
And then came the backlash. After only six years on the throne, Edward VI died. He was succeeded by his elder sister Mary, and she was a fervent and conservative Catholic. Her counter-reformation was led by Cardinal Reginald Pole. He launched a campaign against the reformers which saw 300 people burnt. Cranmer, who had led the revolution under King Edward, was arrested. He was handed over to the Thought Police, to a panel of Catholic intellectuals for re-education. He was to be forced to recant, to accept that the views he'd held were false. Only that way, they felt, could reform be utterly defeated. It's a scene which has been played out countless times across the centuries, in hostage cells, in the secret police headquarters of totalitarian states. Officially sanctioned bullying on a matter of conscience. For Thomas Cranmer, it was to last for two years. These were very special Catholics. Among them were some of the best theological minds in Europe, Spanish Dominicans, brought over specially, self-confident, sophisticated. These were not the sort of Catholics he'd met in his previous years, where the church of the old church was on the defensive all the time. No, now, to his horror, he was meeting Catholics who were part of a new Catholic world. It must have been a terrible psychological shock. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Catholics pushed on, chiseling at the foundations of Cranmer's belief. If God wanted reformation, why was Queen Mary on the throne? And what about his duty to the Queen? All around him, everyone was telling him to recant. It's a really poignant end, because this very old man, isolated, undergoing what I guess we would now regard as a form of brainwashing, certainly a kind of mental torture. He has no one to confirm that his, you know, his theology is right. He's daily being visited, argued with, by very sophisticated Catholic apologists. It's not entirely surprising that he, he gives way under that. This is the biggest catch that the old church had from any Protestant leader. And now they had him in their grasp. They had a speech prepared for him, which he'd written out himself, which was in print. And that was the speech which he would give from the pulpit in the university church in Oxford. Now I come to the great thing that so troubleth my conscience. And that is the setting abroad of writing contrary to the truth, which now, here, I renounce and refuse as being things written by my hand contrary to the truth I thought in my heart, and that is, all such bills and papers that I have written and signed with my hand. Since my degradation, wherein I have written many things untrue. But at the end, Cranmer cheated them by changing the very last paragraph. And for as much as my hand hath offended in writing things contrary to my heart, therefore shall my hand be first punished, for when I come to the fire, it shall be first burned. Christ's enemy and the Antichrist with all his false doctrine. Now that really brought him back uh, to the centre of triumphant Protestantism. And it meant that he could never be a prize for the old church. Cranmer is an 
icon, I think, not of absolutely unqualified heroism, but of a sort of honesty that finally breaks through weakness at the very last moment. <laughs> Shall be first born. That's the symbol of the Protestant Reformation in England. That's at the heart of it, really, for two, three centuries after 1556. Cranmer's death called a temporary halt to Reformation in England, but nonetheless, the English Bible survived and it would continue its revolutionary career down the centuries, right to our own time. People get saved by believing that gospel and by no other means. That's it. Join that band of believers who can become the solution and can turn America upside down again. The story of the English Bible is as important today as it was in Tudor times. Particularly in America. There, the Bible is still at the centre of national politics. And at times of national mourning, the, the President turns naturally to the cadences of Tudor England. As we've been assured, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, can separate us from God's love. God bless America. The Christian right, with its absolutist and literal reading of the Bible, is a potent lobby in America, and its votes helped propel George Bush to power. This movement was spearheaded by preachers like Jerry Falwell of the Southern Baptist Church. We're going to be talking about national repentance. Our nation is in trouble. For Falwell and all of them, it's the Bible that underpins their views. People get saved by believing that gospel and by no other means. That's it. Falwell's church is just one of more than 125,000 English-speaking Protestant churches in America. Not all of them agree with his politics, but they all derive from the same Bible. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit... And it's not an American Bible, it's the English Bible, the authorised version, the King James Bible. Probably the most widely read book in the world, written just decades after the death at the stake of Thomas Cranmer. And seen through Tudor eyes, the truly astonishing thing is that although American churches vary enormously and believe in very different things, there's no bloodshed. A very long way indeed from the chaos of 16th century England. In England, Queen Mary's persecutions had led to more than 300 deaths. But now, in 1558, there was another huge swing of the religious pendulum. Mary was succeeded on the throne by her sister, Elizabeth, Anne Boleyn's daughter. Elizabeth was a convinced Protestant, but she had managed to stay alive during Mary's reign by appearing to conform. Once she was queen, the Church of England was similar. Although its structure with a hierarchy of bishops was traditional, its doctrine was thoroughly reformed. Jesus said to them, it was a calculated compromise, and Elizabeth is famous for her desire not to make windows into men's hearts and secret thoughts. Elizabeth was a very cool Protestant. She'd lived through the absolutely miserable experience of keeping her mouth shut about being a Protestant in the reign of her sister Mary. And that, I think, gave her a sympathy for those who disagreed with her. What she wanted, like all the Tudors, was obedience. And she didn't really care what people thought inside, as long as they obeyed. She clearly didn't want to take the revolution any further. And that meant that anything which survived from the old world in 1552 carried on. 
Cathedrals carried on, choral music in cathedrals, pipe organs all preserved in her church, and Cranmer's liturgy, which is really quite elaborate for a Protestant liturgy. These are some of the things which make Anglicanism different from other Protestantisms. Queen Elizabeth, of course, was assailed on all sides. Abroad, the Pope and the other Catholic powers wanted to get rid of her. And meanwhile, some exiled English Catholics produced an English language version of the Bible just for Catholics. This is it. It's called the Dowie Bible. And if you were caught reading it, you'd get yourself into a bit of hot water. And amidst this new profusion of Bibles, we have this for the Protestants, the Geneva Bible which comes complete with good, strong and rigorous Calvinist commentary in the margins. And both of these Bibles were symbolic objections to the official version, the Bishop's Bible, which is what everyone read in church. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I imagined as a child. But as soon as I was a man, I put away childishness. Now we Throughout Elizabeth's class, reign, Protestant ideas and the language of the English Bible percolated deep into the hearts of the population, reinforced by the huge popularity of Bible texts set to music. And by the time Elizabeth died in the 17th century, the English Bible had engendered a new freedom of thought and inquiry. The great thing about the Bible is that you read it yourself. It is there for you to read, and people did. Now, what that means is that you can make up your own mind on things. And one of the peculiar, precious features of 17th century England was that people did make up their own minds. That seems to me to be one aspect of Englishness, a sort of individual contrariness, an unwillingness to be bounded by clergy or by figures in authority. For some enthusiasts or Puritans, Elizabeth's compromised church was not enough. They wanted root and branch reform and an end to bishops. When Elizabeth was succeeded by her cousin, King James of Scotland, the Puritans were delighted, for the Scots had already destroyed the power of their bishops. They thought their time had come. King James was more than merely a competent king. He was an extremely shrewd and wily politician, and he believed this issue could be resolved. He dragged the bishops and the Puritans right here to Hampton Court and convened a great conference, during which he thought that peace would break out, there would be concord, and harmony would spread throughout his kingdom. As you might imagine, bishops took this rather badly. The conference lasted three whole days, and the bishops took every opportunity to portray the Puritans as dangerous radicals, as indeed many of them were. It looked as if the King's Great Conference was going to come to nothing, and the Puritans would go away empty-handed. But then, one of the Puritan divines raised the question of a new translation of the Bible. The leader of the bishops' party, Richard Bancroft, pounced on the idea. So, King James commissioned a new Bible, whose stated aim was to satisfy all parties. It even draws on the Catholic Dowie Bible. But the vast majority of the text which emerged was Tyndale's work. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. The King James became the standard and has influenced writers of English for four centuries. Right at the start of things, it's sort of hot-wired into our national life. Um, and in the process of being hot-wired into our national life, it's part of our poetic life as well, because that's where that belongs. Clearly, there are poems uh, through the centuries which partake of that, um, either in the sense that they want to borrow its resonances. I think of somebody like Wilfred Owen, as I would say, there's a poem like Strange Meeting. It seemed that out of battle I escaped down some profound dull tunnel, long since scooped through granites which titanic wars had groined. 
Yet also their encumbered sleepers groaned, too fast in thought or death to be bestirred. Then, as I probed them, one sprang up and stared with piteous recognition. The colour of the language throughout the poem has a kind of unnatural density, a sort of purple concentration to it that is clearly biblical in its associations. It's the language of Isaiah. It's an Old Testament language. And Owen, of course, who was a very religious-minded person, knows this. And in the long passages of my life, when I can't find God, I continue reading it because it's extraordinarily interesting, amusing, strange, bizarre, um, and a great forcing house of other, for other ideas. Astonishingly, the King James Bible turned out to be acceptable to everyone. It had achieved its primary aim. Remember, Wycliffe's desire was that the word of God should be available to every Englishman in his own language. And here it was. But as to how the Bible should be interpreted, well, the bitterness, the division, the rancour and the violence was to get worse and worse. The English took to war amongst themselves, a civil war between Crown and Parliament, partly over religious practice. Parliament won, led by Oliver Cromwell, a Puritan descendant of Cranmer's political protector. The English civil wars are a set of text swappings between royalists and parliamentarians. You might say that the parliamentarians had the better texts. And King Charles might not have died if Oliver Cromwell did not think that he was the man of blood to be found in the Bible. That's at least how Cromwell could justify to himself this monstrous act of killing the king. But putting him on trial for his crimes against the people. And what's at the center of that? That biblical image of the man of blood. But 20 years of bitter conflict resulted only in exhaustion on both sides. When King Charles II was restored to the throne, religious toleration became part of the law of the land. As a result, in England, from now on, the Bible ceased to be a contentious issue. The Bible wars were over. But in other places, the Bible remains at the centre of political and social debate, especially in America. Many people who were unhappy with the settlement in England emigrated there. After all, religious freedom was why the Pilgrim Fathers had come to America in the first place. And there were now settlers, not just from England, but from all over Europe, including Protestants who had been persecuted even by other Protestants. At the heart of all this pioneer spirituality was the King James Bible. But each individual community was different, and each followed the Bible in a different way. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Unlike in England, with its state church, conformity was simply not possible. Toleration was a necessity, but the Americans went still further. His disciples... God hath created the mind free, said Thomas Jefferson, and so the First Amendment to the Constitution insists upon a total separation between church and state and guarantees freedom of speech. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. The Bible is a greater political force in America than in any other Western democracy. And some Americans base their political principles on the words of a Bible written nearly 400 years ago. The gospel doesn't change. That's it. Join that band of believers who can become the solution and can turn America upside down again and then turn the world upside down again. Whatever happens in America is going to be exported. It works that way for good or bad. This missionary fervor is a direct descendant of a Protestant zeal of the original Bible revolutionaries. Once again, the Bible is at the center of a cultural battle between traditionalists and modernists. And it's not a simple matter of conservative right and modernist left. It's a matter of how you read the Bible. We understand the Bible to be the authoritative and inerrant 
Word of God. The Bible is not so much a divine product, but a human product about divine things. There are no two ways of looking at what the Bible says. It's only one way. Some people would say it's authoritarian and it's exactly what God would have us believe. There are others of us who would say, let's look at what it means to me in the context of my life and my faith in God. Today, we take for granted the right to disagree about something as vitally important as how the Bible is interpreted. Disagreement like this is fundamental to democracy. It's part and parcel of freedoms we have all come to expect. Freedoms whose first shoots sprang up in English soil more than 600 years ago and were nourished by the courage and the blood of the Bible revolutionaries. Wycliffe, Tyndale and Cranmer believed that the word of God must reach the people directly, otherwise they couldn't be saved. And that's why translation was for them the crucial issue. They assumed, a little easily, that the common people would interpret the Bible much as they'd done. This, however, was not always the case, because now everyone could make of the Bible what they wanted. The holy text was at last ours. And no longer would we have to take any notice of priests, pastors, bishops, or popes. And that, for me, is the greatest legacy of the English Bible. Freedom of choice, freedom of conscience, and freedom of speech. You can find out more at Channel 4's Faith and Belief website, channel4.com slash believe. Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet use the appliance of science to try to erase the pain of a past romance next on 4. Eternal sunshine of the spotless mind.